Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the University of Maryland Extension's Zooming into Healthy Horsekeeping 2020 webinar series. We're very excited to have all of you joining us live and those listening later on to this recording. My name is Jennifer Reynolds. I am the Extension Activity Coordinator for Equine and Poultry Programs at the University of Maryland. I'll be assisting today behind the scenes as host, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Amanda Grev. We're very happy to have her with us. She joined the University of Maryland Extension in 2019 and currently serves as our pasture and forage specialist at the Western Maryland Research and Education Center. Originally from Rochester, Amanda completed her undergraduate degree at North Dakota State University, double majoring in equine and animal science, and then completed an equine nutrition research internship at Kentucky Equine Research. And Amanda has received both her master's and PhD in animal science at the University of Minnesota, where her research focused on the interaction between animal nutrition, forages, and pasture management. It is Nas National Forages Week, so no better time than to have her come and present to us taking out the guesswork, forage selection for horse pastures. All right, thank you very much, Jen. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. And uh, she is correct that this week is National Forage Week. So um, it's kind of perfect timing that we're here today to talk about um, forage selection for horse pastures. Um, so uh, today we're talking about forage selection. Um, we're not here to talk about pasture management today, but I did want to mention um, one small detail about pasture management in the beginning of this presentation, um, only from the standpoint that if pastures are being overgrazed or not well managed, um, and you have something like what you see in the photo here on your screen, or like this, um, even though it looks like there is forage or grass covering those entire fields, um, the inevitable uh, thing that will happen from those fields if they continue to be overgrazed is something like you see in these photos. Um, and really what it comes down to is there is no forage species that's going to persist if a field is continually overgrazed or mismanaged. Um, so we're not gonna talk about pasture management today because that was discussed in a previous week, um, but I did wanna mention that you know there's not gonna be a silver bullet forage species um, that will be the cure-all for um, mismanagement. So we do need to be sure that we are managing our pastures appropriately and accordingly so that we can have that good um, pasture production that we're looking for, like this. Um, so good pasture requires good management, and that will be true no matter what forage species we have in our fields. Um, so that being said, um, today we're going to talk about um, how to decide what to put in our fields or what forages to select for planting. So there are a number of considerations that we want to think about when we're um, debating on forage selection decisions. One of the first is uh, soil type and soil characteristics, things like drainage, fertility, soil pH, um, etc. Those will all influence um, the, what could be the ideal forage for a given field. Um, because there are different forages that do better under you know, well-drained or poorly drained soil, high or low fertility, et cetera. Um, so as we go through some of the different forages today, um, keep that in mind um, when it comes to the soil characteristics. Same thing goes for the amount of land we have as well as the topography or slope of that land. There are forages that will do better in kind of low lying, maybe wetter areas, forages that will be a little bit hardier or more persistent on kind of some of our steeper slope areas. Another important consideration is the intended use for that field or that pasture. Um, of course, if it's a hay field versus a pasture field, that makes a big difference. Um, we'll talk about some permanent forage options uh, for perennial forages um, versus temporary or annual forages. Um, the time of year that we're um, looking to be grazing or using that field, the length of the grazing season and the management system that we use all play a role in um, considering our optimum forage species um, to use. We'll also just very briefly at the end touch on some differences in animal type. We know that um, 
you know, we're here all today, obviously, to talk about horses, um, but there are differences in the type of horse and the workload and the nutrition that that horse may or may not need. Um, and that can play a role um, somewhat into what forage might be appropriate for that horse. And then lastly, um, different things like disease or insect pressure. Um, if we have forages that are consistently um, you know, being overtaken from insects or disease, um, there are varieties that we can choose that are um, more resistant or that are more adapted to um, dealing with those pressures. Um, so these are all kind of an overview of general things um, to keep in mind as we're thinking about our forage selection. So the first thing to consider is different types of forages. Um, before we get into going through some of these different forage types, um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the overview or the broad characteristics pertaining to some different forage types. So the first one is cool season and warm season forages. We know that there are differences between these. Um, we'll get to those in a second. We also have legume options. Um, so we can have you know, traditional grass pastures, we can have legume pastures, we can mix those together um, to combine multiple species into one pasture. As I mentioned, we also have options that are more long-term or perennial forages, and then we have options that are shorter term or annual forages. Um, so we'll talk about a few of the major species within each of those categories. When it comes to forage type, and we think about um, the cool season versus warm season forages, we know that as their name implies, cool season forages do best in a cool or wet climate. Warm season forages do better in a hotter or drier climate. And this will affect the time of year that those forages grow and thrive. So cool season forages grow mostly in the spring and fall. They have this um, kind of dire, di, um, or biennial uh, growth curve where they have a lot of forage growth occurring during the spring. Um, when the weather is cool, we have plenty of moisture and rainfall, and they kind of slack off um, in the summertime or go through what is commonly referred to as the summer slump. And then we have additional growth occurring in the fall when the, when the um, weather is again cooler and a little bit wetter. Warm season forages are just the opposite. They grow mostly during the, the summertime when it's hotter and drier out. So they have most of their forage production occurring during those peak summer months. Um, a few examples of cool season forages that we're going to be talking about today include things like Kentucky bluegrass, Timothy orchard grass, tall fescue, and warm season forages include things like Bermuda grass, hay grass, big blue stem, Indian grass, etc. Um, and one of the things to consider um, when debating if a cool season or warm season forage is appropriate is what part of the country we're in. Um, we know that cool season forages predominate in the northern half of the United States. Warm season forages predominate in the southern part of the United States. Um, and here in Maryland, we fall um, relatively in that transition zone where we can have some um, warm season forages, although we're kind of at the upper end of that. So we're going to be focusing predominantly today on the cool season forages because that's what we see the most of in this area. So when it comes to forage types, um, we know that grasses and legumes have differences in their nutrient content. Grasses tend to be a little bit lower in things like protein and some of the essential minerals like calcium. They're a little bit lower in caloric value and a little bit higher in fiber. Um, they have usually a slightly lower feed intake compared to legumes, um, which generally have a higher feed intake and are relatively uh, preferred by livestock, um, including horses. And um, another benefit of legumes is they are capable of fixing nitrogen. So this means that um, they can fix their own nitrogen from the atmosphere and as such require less um, fertilizer applied um, to the pasture. Um, in general, grasses are usually a little bit more leafy in appearance and legumes are a little bit more tree-like in appearance. So if we break this into those three categories, um, we have our CSG or cool season grasses, WSG or warm season grasses and legumes. And we look at some of our major um, forage nutrients or forage nutritive value components. Um, we can start to see some of these patterns that emerge. Um, I will say that there are a lot of things that influence forage quality. 
So the fact that it is a cool season grass versus a legume, um, there are trends, yes, but that will also be affected by many, many other things. Um, on average though, um, if they're you know, around the similar stage of maturity, legumes usually contain a little bit higher energy. Um, DE or digestible energy is the most common method or measurement for energy for balancing horse rations. And legumes usually contain a little bit higher energy concentration compared to both of our grass options. Legumes also usually contain a little bit more protein. Cool season grasses kind of fall in the middle and warm season grasses are usually a little bit lower in crude protein. When it comes to the fiber, neutral detergent fiber is one of the major um, forage quality uh, values to look at fiber concentration. Legumes are usually a little bit on the lower side when it comes to fiber. Warm season grasses are usually a little bit on the higher side. And again, cool season grasses fall kind of in between. Um, as I mentioned, legumes are usually a little bit higher in some of our essential um, vitamins and minerals like calcium. And then um, RFB is kind of a measure of forage quality. It's relative feed value and kind of wraps a whole bunch of different forage quality terms into one value. Um, so if we look at overall forage quality, legumes tend to be a little bit higher and warm season grasses tend to be a little bit lower while cool season grasses fall somewhere in the middle. That just gives you an, a general idea of the differences in quality between those forage types. Um, if you're a little bit more visual, um, relative forage quality is another um, forage term that kind of wraps a bunch of those forage quality measurements into one term. And I wanted to show you this picture, not only so you could see some differences between different forage types, but also so that you could see the range um, among those different forages. So, you know, if we look at our cool season perennials um, like fescue or orchard grass, um, we see the average for that um, might fall in this example, you know, around 100 for RFQ, but the range you know, went all the way from 75 up to 130 or so. Um, and some of them have even more variability. So that just plays into what I mentioned earlier, where there's a lot more to it than just um, what type of forage that falls into. Um, but in general, here's our cool season perennials. Here is our warm season perennials like Bermuda grass. And here is our legume species. So you can see those trends still um, hold to be relatively true with the legumes having that little bit higher forage quality. Um, I did want to uh, mention the influence of maturity um, just because it is really the greatest determinant of nutritional value. Um, it is the most important thing that will affect the forage quality or the nutritional value of our forages. We know that when forages are more vegetative, um, they're a lot more leafy, they have higher energy and higher protein concentrations. And then as those forages mature, um, they get a little bit more stemmy, a little bit more fibrous, and a little bit lower in the overall forage quality. Um, so when it comes to um, growth characteristics, there are also kind of two main um, classes or divisions of within forage types. So we can have forages that act as a bunch grass um, which grow in a tufted growth habit, um, like what you see in the bottom left corner. You can see that that is growing in a thick um, clump or a bunch um, versus something like a sod forming grass, um, which has a lateral growth ha habit. Um, the key between or the key, you know, difference among these two types is that bunch grasses don't always spread into bare spots. So that grass is going to continue to grow in that clump versus a sod forming grass can start to spread and fill in some of those bare areas. Um, they do this through usually one of two means, either a rhizome, which travels below the soil surface, or a stolon, which travels above the soil surface. Um, the other thing with sod forming grasses is they can typically tolerate a little bit closer grazing um, because they have the ability to spread via those rhizomes or stolons. Um, they can tolerate a little bit of that extra grazing pressure, usually a little bit better than some of our bunch grasses. Um, on the flip side, bunch grasses typically are a little bit higher yielding. They grow taller, higher, um, more um, bushy and big, so they usually have a little bit higher yields than our sod forming grasses. So as we go through the different forage types today, um, we will see you know, the difference in some of them being a bunch grass and some of them being a sod forming grass. 
There are a few that kind of fall in the middle, um, which is what the photo in the center um, in the bottom is indicating, um, where they're technically a bunch grass, but they do have some capability to spread. So we'll make a note of that as well. All right, so the first ones we're gonna go through are um, the most common of our cool season perennial forages. Um, so we're starting off with orchard grass, um, which is a bunch grass. And for each of these forages, as we go through them, what I did was wrote out a few of the pros and cons um, for that particular forage. So for orchard grass, um, you know, we, we know that this is a very productive forage. It's very palatable, readily grazed, or usually consumed in hay also. Um, it has good regrowth um, as long as it has good soil fertility and good enough moisture to continue to grow. It is compatible with legumes, so it's often grown in a mixture. Um, usually you'll see like an al alfalfa orchard grass mix, um, and it is relatively easy and quick to establish. Um, some of the cons for orchard grass are it's a little bit more sensitive to cutting height. So it is a bunch grass, um, which means that it stores a lot of its energy in the bottom few inches of the stem or the tillers. Um, so if if it is continually um, cut or grazed down to too low of a height, um, we're depleting a lot of those energy reserves that are stored in that stem base. And that, you know, over time will result in less persistence or less survivability if that plant continues to be either harvested or grazed um, too low down to the ground. Um, so that's why when it comes to grazing management, um, it can be a really important thing when we're thinking about um, forage selection and uh, the longevity of our forage stand. Orchard grass is also a little bit more sensitive to soil fertility, um, so it doesn't grow as well if we have um, less fertile soils or lower uh, pH or more acidic soils. Um, there are a few diseases that it is sensitive to, so in general orchard grass can be a really productive, really good quality forage, but it does require um, better management. It can't be um, kind of used and abused like maybe some of our other forages um, that we'll see in a minute. So one thing that I did to try to make these forages a little bit more memorable, at least for our um, usual cool season perennials, is I came up with a sort of nickname for these forages based on their different characteristics. And for orchard grass, we have the class favorite. Um, it's very well liked, it's very widely used, um, you know, and it, it's just kind of the favorite of the bunch um, in general. The next uh, cool season perennial that we're going to talk about is tall fescue. Um, so tall fescue is also a bunch grass. You can see in that top photo um, how it's growing in a really thick um, clump or bunch. However, tall fescue does have um, some ability to spread um, via rhizomes um, underneath the soil surface. The pros of tall fescue are that it is very deep rooted and long lived. It's very hardy and very tolerant of traffic and close grazing. So it is one of the ones that can handle a little bit more grazing pressure or hoof traffic compared to something like an orchard grass would. Um, it is adapted to a range of soil and climate conditions. Um, so it can tolerate a little bit more um, acidic soils or a little bit poor fertility soils. Um, it is high yielding and does have, um, you know, a good season long yield distribution. Um, and it does work really well for stockpiling forages. Um, so if you're looking to set a few pastures aside um, in the, you know, early fall, late summer time frame and kind of stockpile those for later grazing, tall fescue works very, very well for that. Um, the cons of tall fescue are it's um, usually less palatable and they can be a little bit tough, um, a little bit um, rougher of a forage, and it's usually not quite as high of quality. Um, tall fescue has, um, as you see in the middle photo, these very prominent um, veins that go down the, um, the leaf of the plant. Um, and if you run your fingers down those, you can actually feel um, how it's a little bit rough to the touch which generally makes it a little bit less palatable. I did want to uh, mention while we're talking about tall fescue, the different types of tall fescue, um, not varieties, but, um, oh, sorry, I forgot. The, um, the nickname for tall fescue is Mr. Persistent uh, because 
it is very hardy and very long-lived and can in fact be hard to kill in some circumstances. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the different types of tall fescue for anyone who might not be familiar with the, um, the, the term endophyte or you know novel endophyte tall fescue. Um, basically there are kind of three main types or groups of tall fescue. Um, the first is the endophyte infected or toxic endophyte um, tall fescue. This is kind of the old school traditional varieties um, often referred to as Kentucky 31. Um, that's kind of the old standby for a endophyte infected tall fescue. And the problem with this um, is that it contains an endophyte that lives inside the plant that produces toxic alkaloids. And um, for horses in particular, this, if they are grazing it or consuming it, will impair reproductive performance of mares. Um, for other livestock species, there are other detrimental side effects um, like impaired growth, um, vasoconstriction of the blood vessels, poor performance, etc. In horses, this majorly, um, the major cause is in the poor reproductive performance. Um, and so what they have done is they basically removed this endophyte or bred um, a, a new type of fescue that is an endophyte free. So this contains no endophyte. So this on the plus side has no harmful effects to the livestock that are consuming it. Um, but on the downside, they realized that that endophyte had a mutually beneficial relationship with the plant. And so it was giving the plant a lot of that hardiness, that durability, that long-term persistence that made it so persistent. So when we took the endophyte out and we have endophyte-free fescue, um, what they found was a lot of times there was reduced plant vigor or reduced longevity of that stand. Um, those plants didn't persist quite as long. So what researchers did was um, developed a novel endophyte that could be um, put back into the fescue that wasn't the toxic one. Um, so it's a different endophyte strain and there's no toxic alkaloids. And these novel endophyte varieties have no harmful effects to livestock, but they still retain that uh, forage persistence or that hardiness, um, have that mutually beneficial relationship between the fescue and the endophyte. Um, so I just wanted to give people a brief overview because that can be a really confusing um, area of um, information and um, so that you're aware of these three different types of fescue that are out there. All right, moving on to our next cool season perennial. Um, next we have Timothy, um, which is also a bunch grass. One of the pros of Timothy is that it's really palatable, it has good quality, and it's relatively quick to establish. However, um, the cons of Timothy are that usually there is less regrowth after the first initial, um, you know, accumulation of growth in the spring. It doesn't do very well under hot or dry conditions. Um, it can be less competitive and shorter lived. Um, it has a little bit of a shallower root system and it can be easily weakened um, by frequent cutting or grazing. So because of all of those reasons, um, in general, Timothy is usually better suited for hay production. Um, we can get that good hay crop off of it um, in the beginning of the year and then give that forage you know, time to regrow um, and not have to worry about the added pressure from grazing, um, depleting the longevity of that forage. Um, so because of that, um, the nickname for Timothy is the one hit wonder um, because we really have one big uh, flux of production in the beginning of the year, and then it's a lot less productive for the rest of the grazing season. Um, perennial ryegrass is another cool season perennial. This one is also a bunch grass. Um, it is also very high in quality and very palatable. Um, it has good yield and it establishes very rapidly. So it has good seedling vigor. Um, those plants get up out of the ground and grow very quickly. Um, some of the cons for perennial ryegrass are it can be a little bit shorter lived and it's also not as tolerant of drought or high temperatures. So I moved um, to Maryland from Minnesota, as you heard from the introduction, and there is a lot more perennial ryegrass um, grown up in Minnesota where it's a little bit cooler. Um, we have less, you know, drought and long periods of heat in the summer um, than we do down here in Maryland or the Mid-Atlantic region. So ryegrass really likes kind of those nice, cool, temperate climates. 
Um, it's, it's very popular in places like New Zealand or Ireland um, and is really widely used there. And because of that, ryegrass is our fair weather fan. Um, so then um, it will, you know, it's, it's very accustomed to those kind of temperate or moderate uh, climates. When it comes to Kentucky bluegrass, um, this one is a sod forming grass. So unlike the previous ones that we've talked about as bunch grasses, Kentucky bluegrass has the ability to spread via rhizomes that grow beneath the soil surface um, and fill in that sod a little bit. Uh, some of the pros for Kentucky bluegrass are it is very palatable and has good quality. Um, it is a sod former, which helps um, you know, fill in some of those uh, bare areas in the, in the pasture. But it can be, or and it can be a little bit less sensitive to closer or more frequent grazing. Um, because it is that sod forming grass and it can spread via rhizomes, um, it can tolerate a little bit more grazing pressure. Some of the cons of Con Kentucky bluegrass are that because it's a little bit lower growing, it's not quite as productive and it's not quite as high yielding. Um, so we won't see the productivity from that as we will with, you know, our bunch grasses like orchard grass, um, fescue, etc. Um, ryegrass is also another one that will kind of go dormant during those hot or dry periods. So you'll see um, a lot less growth happening um, when the weather is not cool or optimal for it. Um, so because it has the ability to kind of fill in and um, build up the, the bare spots in our pasture, bluegrass is um, the turf builder forage. Another one of our cool season perennials is smooth brome grass. Um, this one is also a sod former. Like bluegrass, it can spread via those rhizomes. Some of the pros for smooth brome grass are that it, it can be good quality. Um, it's deep rooted and relatively hardy, and it can survive uh, periods of drought or temperature extremes. Um, on the con side, it is really slow to establish, um, and it can be hard to get a good stand established. It is a little bit like Timothy in that it has a very uneven yield distribution. So it has a lot of yield and a lot of production occurring in the beginning of the season or the start of that growing season. Um, and then it has much poorer growth during those hot or dry conditions. Um, so like Timothy, this one is usually a little bit better suited for hay because under a grazing situation, we really want that consistent production throughout the whole grazing season rather than a large flush at the beginning and then less production during that summer, during those summer months. Um, so because it's hard to get established, um, but can be persistent once it is, smooth brome grass is um, slow and steady. Another cool season perennial um, that's a little bit less uh, familiar probably is reed canary grass. This is another sod former, so again it can spread via rhizomes. Um, reed canary grass can actually be a really high yielding forage and it can be very persistent once it's established. Um, it is drought tolerant, but it's also one of the forages that's very flood tolerant. Um, so you'll oftentimes see reed canary grass growing along stream banks or roadside ditches if water is, you know, accumulated there for longer periods of time. It's one of the forages that can handle um, what we like to refer to as wet feet or, you know, having a more poorly drained soil. Uh, reed canary grass um, is a little bit like smooth brome in that it can be more difficult to establish um, and is a little bit slower to get established. It can also be um, somewhat more stemmy and less palatable if it gets too mature. Um, it has the potential to be kind of more stemmy than we would like for um, optimal forage production. Um, so because it can handle those wetter areas and um, those less well-drained soils, free canary grass is the pool boy. Uh, this is often found in those wet areas. Switching um, from our cool season perennial grasses into our cool season perennial legumes, um, one of the first uh, perennial legumes that probably comes to your mind is alfalfa. This is a very high quality legume. Um, so it is very palatable, um, very productive. Um, it, it is drought resistant. It has very deep tap root. Um, it can be long lived and it can have good summer production. Um, so it will continue to um, be a little bit more productive during the heat of the summer than some of our cool season grasses will. Um, 
Alfalfa is a little bit like orchard grass in that it requires um, really good soil fertility. So it needs a higher soil pH, it needs um, well-drained soils. Um, it can also be a little bit harder to establish or, or um, alternatively ha just have a higher establishment cost. Um, sometimes the seed for alfalfa can be relatively expensive. Um, so it does need that, you know, better management, um, kind of like orchard grass, which is why, you know, I think the two are often paired well together or grow well together. Um, but overall, it's um, one of the best forages from a quality and a production standpoint. And I didn't even have to come up with a nickname for this one. Um, alfalfa has long been known as the queen of forages um, because of that high quality and that high productivity. Another uh, cool season perennial legume is red clover. Um, red clover is uh, relatively easy to establish. Um, it has good quality and yield um, and can also be very palatable forage crop. Um, it is a little bit more tolerant of our more acidic or our more poorly drained soils than alfalfa. Um, so if our soil fertility is not quite up to par um, to have alfalfa or you know, we're not quite as interested in alfalfa, um, red clover can be a good um, next option. It is a little bit shorter lived than alfalfa. Um, generally the stand life is limited to um, two to three years. One of the other pros for red clover and also white clover, which we'll get to in a second, um, is that they do very well under a uh, frost seeding situation. So um, even though the lifespan is a little bit shorter, we can go in in those late winter, very early spring months and um, frost seed some clover into our existing stands. And it is one of the forages that does well um, or has good establishment um, success with frost seeding. So that can be a way to get it reestablished um, and, and lengthen that stand life. Because uh, red clover is kind of, you know, the, the one step down, I guess, um, but good in many ways from alfalfa, um, and it also happens to be red, um, it is the red-headed stepchild of the family. Uh, next we have white clover. Um, this is a, another legume. White clover has the ability to spread via stolons, and which you can see in the middle picture on the right. Um, it can spread via those stolons that travel across the top of the soil surface. Um, like red clover, it is um, very easy to establish. It's also good quality and very palatable, and it can do very well in mixtures. Um, because it has those stolons and can help spread um, to new areas of the field, and put down roots in new spots, it can be a little bit more grazing tolerant um, compared to our other uh, legume options. On the con side, white clover is usually not as high yielding as either red clover or alfalfa. And because it's a little bit lower growing, it can be susceptible to shading if it's grown in a mix and those forage grasses are really tall, um, they can have potential to shade out the white clover underneath. Um, there are a couple of different types of white clover. Um, there's kind of the white Dutch clover, which is the traditional kind that you kind of see everywhere. It's very short growing. Um, it doesn't produce a lot of forage, but it's very low growing little clover leaves that you kind of see all around. And then there's the Ladino type, which is um, a more improved uh, white clover option that is a larger and taller growing type. So it will have more production compared to the, um, the white Dutch type. And because white clover is kind of everywhere, um, even, you know, in places that we may not have seeded it, um, it's kind of the old faithful. Um, it always pops up and always sticks around um, in, it seems, everywhere. One of the other um, forages that I wanted to mention that it, um, previously wasn't quite as popular but has since been increasing in popularity is uh, forage chicory. And forage chicory is actually a forb. And I want to emphasize that I place the word forage in front of chicory. Um, so this is not the same as kind of the weedy chicory that you might see growing in the roadside ditches, which is um, what you see pictured in the middle photo on the screen. Um, forage chicory is actually an improved variety of chicory um, that was developed to be more leafy um, and have less stems and be more um, higher quality and have better forage production. So that's what you see in the top photo on this uh, screen. And forage chicory, um, I wanted to mention it because it's increasing in popularity. It can be a really high quality forage option. It's usually very palatable. Um, it is 
uh, relatively drought tolerant and can be um, have good productivity in the summertime. And um, especially for the small ruminant community, it can have some of those anthelmintic properties. Um, it contains more um, condensed tannins, which can have um, somewhat of a deworming effect um, for some of those internal parasites. On the con side, um, it can still be prone to bolting, which is what you see in the bottom right photo, which basically is where those tall stems come up out of um, the, the base growth of forage. And so usually when it's um, bolting, we want to kind of um, mow off or, or clip off those, those stems so that it can continue to be the good um, leafy vegetative growth. Um, it is a little bit better for well-drained soils and it can be a little bit shorter lived. Um, and it doesn't really um, dry down very easily or very nicely for hay. So it's usually a little bit better suited under a grazing situation. And because it is um, good quality and it looks a lot like um, spinach with those high um, dark green leaves, uh, forage chicory is Popeye's pick. So um, I wanted to mention our warm season perennial um, grasses, the major ones at least. Um, I'm not going to go into each of these um, just because um, A for time purposes and B because they are less common in this area. Um, but I just wanted to mention them so that you're aware, um, you know, there are a number of warm season perennial forages that are, um, I think, starting to become a little bit more popular and more common, um, even for our area. I know that um, uh, Virginia is doing a lot of work looking at um, native warm season perennials, um, like gamma grass, Indian grass, etc. Um, under horse grazing. So if you have an interest in those, um, feel free to reach out to me or um, do a Google search for warm season perennial um, native forages and you'll probably see some of that information um, pop up. But here's just kind of the major um, warm season perennials um, that you might see or hear of um, as you're looking at different forage options. I did want to um, go over a little bit of the difference between perennial forages, which is what we have been talking about, and annual forages. Um, which are the ones that need to be replanted every year. So it's a lot like um, some of the flowers or garden plants that you may grow, um, where perennials will continue to grow back year after year and annuals will need to be replanted. Um, because they are kind of that long-term uh, forage type, perennials tend to be a little bit slower to establish and are a little bit slower growing. Our annuals um, are quick to establish and are a little bit faster growing usually. Um, and then you can see um, a few examples of each, the perennials, like what we've already talked about, Kentucky bluegrass, orchard grass, Timothy, fescue. And some of the annuals include things like annual ryegrass, our cereal grains like wheat or oat or triticale. Um, there are warm season annuals like Sudan grass and millet. Um, and annuals traditionally have been used a lot for um, double cropping, whereas perennials were used more for permanent pasture. Um, but I wanted to mention the annuals, um, A, so you're familiar with them, and B, because there are a lot of instances where annual forages might be a useful addition to some of our perennial forages um, for a variety of different reasons. And what I mean by that are, um, we're going to go over kind of a few scenarios where annual forages um, might be useful or beneficial to kind of fit into our system. One is um, extending the grazing season a little bit earlier or later into the um, spring or later into the fall. Uh, so what you see on the screen now is your traditional um, cool season perennials, bluegrass, orchard grass, fescue, the grasses, and clover, white or ladino, red and alfalfa. And you can see the growth curves for those different forages. And you can also see, you know, that little bit of increased summer production from those legume clovers and alfalfa compared to our um, cool season grasses. If we add on top of this uh, some of our cool season annuals, um, we can see things like um, annual ryegrass or some of our small grains can start growing a little bit earlier in the spring and will grow a little bit later into the fall. Um, so they can be a good option for kind of extending that grazing season a little bit earlier or a little bit later into the year. And if we look at some of our warm season annuals, like sorghum sudan grass, pearl millet, um, because those are warm seasons, of course, their production is um, in the kind of heat of the summer. 
So they have those growth curves happening kind of in that during that summer slump period when the rest of the forages are a little bit more dormant. So, you know, if we create a pasture system where we can kind of layer all of these different things together, and we might get something a little bit more like this, where we have our cool seasons, kind of in that spring fall growth curve, cool season annuals, kind of extending those ends a little bit, and warm season annuals filling in that middle summer slump period. So the goal would be to try to level out the production of uh, forage throughout the entire season, rather having that, um, you know, biannual um, growth uh, fluctuation. Another use of annual forages is um, to, if we need replacement pasture or a quick fix when there's been like an emergency grazing situation. And what I mean for uh, or by emergency grazing situations would be something like um, winter killed forage, which I realize is a little bit less common um, here in Maryland than it was for me up in Minnesota. Um, but also circumstances like flooding, um, if flooding has come in and killed our existing pasture, drought has come in and killed our existing pasture, um, annual forages because they are quick to establish and fast growing, um, we can use these to kind of provide a replacement pasture for these types of situations. They can also be really useful when it comes to pasture renovation. Um, so pasture can require renovation for a number of different reasons. You know, we can have our overgrazed pasture that we're looking to do some renovation on. We can have a neglected field that we may have um, decided to start using again or um, just acquired a new field that's been neglected that needs a little bit of renovation or even things like uncooperative weather. Um, you know, a few, uh, a few, a couple of years ago, we had a really, really wet um, fall season and a lot of people had a lot of um, damage to their pasture from the, the water and the mud and um, you know, the mess that that made. So um, under some circumstances, we may need a little bit of pasture renovation. And this might be a time to, you know, plant and grow, you know, one or a couple of cycles of annual forages to kind of provide um, some growth in the, while we're looking to transition back to a perennial species um, or a perennial pasture, or to um, help with things like um, alleviating some soil compaction or um, getting weeds under control if we have a lot of um, weed pressure from a build, you know, buildup of weed seeds in the seed bank. Um, so different things like that um, just might be something to consider, you know, if you're interested in looking into some of the annual forage options. So I'm not going to go into all of the annuals because there are a lot of them, um, but I wanted to cover a few that would be probably more um, commonly used for horses in particular. Um, the first is annual or Italian ryegrass. Um, this is very similar to the, the perennial ryegrass that we talked about um, before, um, but instead of you know, being a perennial forage, this is the annual version of that. Um, so like the perennial one, it is very palatable and high in quality. Um, it's easy to establish and it has very good seedling vigor and um, good growth or rapid growth. It can provide fall and early spring forage. So if you were to plant this in the fall, um, you can get fall growth uh, or fall grazing from that forage. And then um, it can overwinter and provide additional forage that following spring. Um, it can also be interceded to kind of help, you know, fill in some areas if need be, if we need a temporary or a quick fix. Um, one of the things to be aware of with um, annual or Italian ryegrass is that it can be a little bit overly competitive in mixtures. Um, so we have to be careful not to let it um, take over too much. Um, and it's less tolerant of drought or high temperatures. So a little bit like its um, perennial counterpart, um, it likes, you know, a little bit of the, that nice, cool, fair weather. For um, Another option for cool season annuals is the different winter cereals. So this can include anything like barley, rye, wheat, triticale. Um, and these are all, um, they all can have good quality and good yield. Um, they're usually relatively easy to establish. Um, again, they can provide fall and early spring forage. Um, if you choose a winter um, of any of those uh, variety or the, any of those species. Um, and then these, you know, they're traditionally, um, we think of the winter cereals as being harvested for grain, like what you might see in the bottom left picture. Um, but these actually can be a really good forage source 
um, for grazing as well if we just graze them at a little bit earlier maturity. Um, the, the major difference between these different species is that they vary a little bit in their cold tolerance, um, their forage quality, and the rate of maturity. So how fast they get to that, um, that maturity or that seed head production can vary between these different ones. Um, when we think about warm season annuals rather than cool season annuals, um, one of the ones that is um, more, more common or more popular is pearl millet. And um, this, or pearl millet, because it's a warm season annual, is a little bit more tolerant of drought. Um, it's also relatively tolerant of acidic soils. It can be um, relatively easy to establish. It has good regrowth. So um, there are several other millets, um, like Japanese millet or German millet, that kind of produce a one and done forage crop. So they won't necessarily regrow after a grazing or a harvest. Um, pearl millet is the one that will regrow repeatedly. Um, pearl millet doesn't have the, uh, the prussic acid concerns that something like a Sudan grass or sorghum Sudan grass might have. Um, on the con side, it can become kind of tall and have um, a larger stem size, especially as it gets more mature. Um, and it can still, under some under certain circumstances, be subject to um, nitrate accumulation. So if we're looking for a pearl millet uh, for grazing, we probably want to look for a dwarf variety because those are a little bit shorter and leafier and um, better suited for grazing. The other thing to be aware of for pearl millet um, is that we need to leave a little bit higher stubble height than we normally would for our um, for our cool season forages when it, if we want that regrowth. So we want to leave like a six to 10 inch um, stubble height um, in order to allow enough material for um, good regrowth from that forage. Another warm season option um, is teff. Um, teff is uh, very palatable and very fine stem. It has a really high leaf to stem ratio. And you can see um, a picture of teff in the bottom right corner um, and how fine the leaves are and the stems. Um, it, it does have good quality. Um, it is a warm season, so it is heat and drought tolerant, and it does grow rapidly um, once established. Um, the good thing about TEF is there's um, no concerns with um, prussic acid or nitrates like there is with some of the other um, warm season annuals. The downside of TEF is that it has a very small seed size and low seed seedling vigor, so it can be really tricky to get it established and to come up well. Um, you kind of have to be really careful with your um, planting and your um, coordination of you know, getting that seed in the ground and make sure you're you know, up, to, up, to, up to snuff with um, your planting considerations if you're gonna be putting in tech. Um, it is um, one of the ones that's more sensitive to cool soil or frost, so make sure that you're waiting until the soil is warm enough to get that um, seed in the ground. And it is somewhat shallow rooted, um, so it's a little bit more sensitive to overgrazing or, or low cutting heights um, compared to some of the other um, warm season options. So it's a little bit more sensitive and a little bit trickier, um, but it is a, a good option if we can make that work. The last warm season annual that I wanted to mention is um, crabgrass. Like the um, chicory, it feels kind of funny to be recommending or um, suggesting something that um, is traditionally thought of as a weed as a forage option. Um, but actually they have developed um, new varieties of crabgrass that are improved varieties that are meant for um, forage production. And these varieties are productive and they can be good quality. Um, Crabgrass is a little bit um, like leafier and would be more similar maybe to what a horse might be used to compared to something like a pearl millet. Um, it can grow very rapidly and um, will reseed itself um, if it is allowed to go to seed. Um, it is, you know, like the other warm seasons, relatively drought tolerant. Crabgrass is also fairly tolerant of acidic soils and we don't really have those um, prussic acid or nitrate concerns as much with crabgrass. Um, it's kind of a little bit like TEF in that the smaller seed size can make planting a little bit difficult. Um, and again, we want to make sure that for crabgrass, we have, you know, those new improved uh, forage varieties and not, um, you know, what is the old or traditional kind of more weedy types. All right, so 
you know, we have we don't have time to cover all the different forage options, but I hope this gives you kind of a good overview of some of the major ones that are used in um, this area. Um, again, the important thing when we're trying to decide um, which of these to use is to match those plants that we have as options to our soil and our site characteristics. So, you know, we mentioned some of this earlier, but consider your soil type, your drainage, um, the moisture of your soil, the soil fertility, the pH, the topography, etc. And the reason for this is because as we saw as we were going through some of these, there are differences in the um, ability of those species to thrive or do well under different um, types of soil or different growing conditions. So this table is just kind of an overview or, um, you know, a broad snapshot of um, this concept. So the left column is um, different levels of drainage. So VPD is very poorly drained, PD poorly drained, SPD is somewhat poorly drained, and um, MWD is moderately well drained. Um, fertility, you know, is um, medium to high or medium or high. Um, different levels of soil pH and then our species. So you can see, you know, if we have very poorly drained soils, um, something like a timothy or a smooth brome grass is not going to do as well under those conditions. If we have really acidic soil, you know, we're not really going to be able to get our orchard grass or our rye grass to do as well under that soil type. So it's really important to think about these different things when we're making our forage selection decisions. Um, this first table is just an overview of all of the grasses. Um, this second table is the same exact thing, but for some of our legumes. So again, be thinking about, you know, the different things like drainage and fertility when we're making decisions. Um, alfalfa is not going to do well if, you know, it's not in a well-drained soil and it doesn't have that fertility and that high soil pH that it needs. Um, so just be aware of that when you're thinking about um, for your forage selection decisions. So once we have matched our plants to kind of the soil and the site, we also need to match them to our intended use. So, you know, we talked about some of the forages that are better or worse for hay versus pasture. We talked about, you know, some that are better or worse for permanent or long-term pasture versus like an annual for a temporary forage. Um, time of year, of course, cool versus warm season and management systems, some that are a little bit more or less tolerant of um, grazing pressure, especially. Um, so think about your intention and your management system when you're choosing some of these different forages. Um, and then the last thing is to think about matching our plants to the livestock requirements. Um, so species, you know, we're here talking about horses today, but we know that there are different classes of horses with different requirements. Um, and, you know, if we look at um, something like this, it's just a the scale of relative forage quality or overall forage quality along the um, x-axis and um, you know different groups of animals kind of ranked according to what quality they might need and you know if you have an idle horse they really don't need that high forage quality that you know a working horse or a brood mare might need or even a harder working horse or a nursing mare um, so you know be mindful of um, the type of horse and the level of production that you are looking for when you're making these forage selections. If, um, if we think about, you know, does my horse need the highest quality pasture that I can produce? If you have one of these types of horses, hmm, probably not, right? These horses don't really need those, that extra high quality from say an alfalfa. Um, as if you have um, horses under these kinds of situations, you know, brood mares, high performance horses, then yeah, it's much more likely that they're going to need a higher quality forage. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're making these decisions. Um, all right, so what should I plant? Consider those um, three different um, characteristics or um, options. Choose an appropriate base forage or a couple um, based on those different characteristics. Um, it's never a bad idea to include a mix of forage types. Um, so, you know, a couple of different grasses, maybe a legume um, thrown in there. Um, one thing I will say, if you choose to do a mixed forage stand right away, um, you will really limit your um, weed control or your herbicide options um, by having that legume product in there. Um, so sometimes what people like to do is, you know, if they want to have a legume, but maybe don't want it, um, but maybe want the option of having some weed control 
um, or herbicide options in the beginning, um, start with you know a couple of different grasses, and then you can always either um, overseed or frost seed in you know something like a clover um, after you've gotten that forage um, well established and you've gotten the weeds under control. Um, so that's you know just an extra little consideration. And then lastly, we should always um, you know choose a high performing variety. So we know that there's a lot of different varieties available out there. I really suggest that you look at some of the variety trials from like the University of Kentucky or Penn State um, where they've tested these different forage varieties under different types of soil and different conditions and actually seen how they've performed um, from a yield and a quality and even a persistence standpoint. Um, so it's never a bad idea to do that. Um, I did include um, my contact information on here. Um, in case anybody has you know, additional questions that you think of later or you, know, you know, want to reach out at another time. Um, so my email and my um, number are on there. And then I think we are open to taking any questions. And we do have some questions. So I'm going to back up here and start with um, them from the beginning so that I can scroll down. And again, if anyone else has a question that you'd like to add to the chat, please go ahead and do that now. So we did have a question on any info you might have or know about zoysia pasture, zoysia grass as a pasture grass. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I am um, not super familiar with using zoysia grass for pasture um, because it is more commonly used as a um, for a lawn forage um, or for you know a turf kind of forage. Um, that being said, I know that there has been some interest um, over the last few years in using more of the kind of turf or lawn type uh, forages as a pasture um, with the thinking that uh, we're going to provide a good um, surface and we don't need a lot of you know high tonnage or high forage production um, but what we want is a um, a surface that is not going to be you know erodible and is going to maintain a good um, uh, sod forming i guess um, for lack of a better word so they've started to look at that i know there is a study that was done actually here at the university of maryland um, a few years ago I, I can't remember if they had zoysia grass in there or not, um, or which grasses they included. So I would have to follow up on that and get back to you. Um, so if you want to shoot me an email, we can um, look into that a little bit further. And the, the question with that would be regarding recommended grasses for pasture um, for insulin resistant ponies. Yeah. So. Um, when it comes to things like insulin resistance and equine metabolic syndrome, that's where things you know, always start to get a little bit more complicated. Um, with those types of horses, what we need to do is limit the non-structural carbohydrates or the starches and sugars component of the forage. Um, the problem is that it's not easy to figure out um, how to do that or the best way to do that. Um, and that's because those levels vary um, based on the type of forage, based on the maturity, based on the time of year, based on even the time of day. Um, so, you know, you could take a, a forage sample from your pasture at 9 a.m. and it would be um, one level of non-structural carbohydrates and you could take it at 4 p.m. and it would be a, a completely different level of non-structural carbohydrates. So um, there's not really a good forage option that's like a low NSC option. I will say that in general, um, warm season forages tend to be a little bit lower in non-structural carbohydrates compared to the cool season forages. So that is something to consider. Um, that's true usually both of the warm season annuals and the warm season perennials. Um, so that could be something to look into. The otherwise, um, you really have to rely on management for um, kind of managing that, you know, whether that's minimizing intake by using a grazing muzzle, you know, turning them out um, in the evening or overnight, um, because that's when uh, the non-structural carbohydrate levels are usually lowest. Um, they kind of build during the day, peak, you know, around 4 p.m. and then kind of decrease um, through the overnight hours. Um, so different things like that we can do to kind of help manage it um, from a management standpoint. 
Our next question is about the perennial rye. Um, with the perennial rye, is it a fall and spring flush and then done? Or what, what was the growth again on the perennial rye? Um, yeah, so that is the difference between the perennial ryegrass and the um, annual or the Italian ryegrass. Um, so what you're thinking of is the annual or Italian type, um, which is the one that will, um, you know, grow in the fall and grow in the spring and then be done. Versus a perennial ryegrass um, is more of a perennial forage like our other, you know, Timothy and orchard grass. Um, and it will, it should persist for multiple years. We have a question about triticale nutritional content. Is it similar or better to oats? Um, I would say that when it comes to the nutrient content, uh, they're probably relatively similar. The bigger influence on that would be um, the maturity at which that forage would cut or was cut or harvested or grazed or however it was, um, was handled. Um, you know, if we have a immature oat versus a mature triticale, um, you know, that immature oat's probably gonna be a higher quality and, you know, the opposite were true, were, were, would be the same. Um, if we have an immature triticale and a higher maturity oat, um, it would be the opposite. So um, I think that plays more of a role in the quality than um, just which species that we use. We can get good quality forage from either of those. Our next question is about the nitrate toxicity you had mentioned with some species and what effect, how, how are horses affected by that? Um, yeah, so nitrate toxicity is um, more common in ruminants than it is in horses, um, but it can still, um, there can still be some toxicity issues for horses. Um, basically, um, what happens is um, the nitrate is converted to nitrite um, and there are some forages that can accumulate higher levels of nitrates. Um, the most common ones are things like the Sudan grass, sorghum Sudan grass, um, Johnson grass, um, and when they accumulate, you know, too high of a level of nitrates, um, that is when you start to see those toxicity issues. So um, the nitrate is converted to nitrite um, in the GI tract of the horse and that nitrite is absorbed into the blood um, and it can cause damage to the hemoglobin, um, which is, you know, what allows the red blood cells to carry oxygen and basically um, prevents them from carrying oxygen. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, the overarching um, background behind the nitrate toxicity. Um, let me know if that answered your question or if you need more information on a certain part of it. And the last question that we have in the chat right now is about sourcing seed. How do we, the collective we, get local shops to carry seed? I found that they are pushing pasture blends. All of us that are trying to make better pastures know that blends are crap. <laughs> Blends are not always the highest quality. Yeah, so um, that can be really um, challenging because um, depending on the person, um, some people want to make their own mix and some people, you know, want to purchase something that's already mixed so they don't have to worry about figuring out the different calculations that go behind mixing different seeding rates and different seed sizes and everything together. Um, so they try to make it easy for um, you or us um, but it might not necessarily always correspond to um, the same thing that we want. Um, so what I suggest is um, working through, um, less through, you know, a, a, I don't want to say generic, but a, a more common place like um, Southern States and more through like an actual seed dealer. Um, they usually have a little bit more flexibility, you know, a mill or a seed dealer or somewhere, someplace like that usually has a little bit more flexibility when it comes to um, getting individual things purchased and um, not having a limited selection of blends or mixed products. Um, that's, I guess, my best advice for that. 
Okay, I do not see any other questions coming up in our chat. Um, there's just a, a follow up to that about getting a list of suggested um, dealer oh. seed dealers or sources. And yeah, I'm, sure. Uh, Amy, I can uh, send you a list of dealers, but that's no problem. And we can certainly add a link um, with that information to the description on this video when we post it online too, so that it will be available for anyone listening later. Yep, that sounds good. So if there are no other questions, we will wrap up for the day. We hope that you've gotten some valuable information. We're able to get your questions answered. Again, we will include the information in the description of the webinar when it's posted and you're welcome to always contact us with questions you might have specific to your situation and we'll make sure they get forwarded to someone that can help you. Remember to follow our Facebook page, Equine Studies at the University of Maryland. We do try to include all of our upcoming events, activities, and information that we have to share on that page through social media. Our web page also has a lot of resources. When you get to that home page and look under the resources tab, you'll find a lot of both print as well as video resources for helping you plan and manage pastures and planting, as well as some other topics regarding our horse keeping. And remember that our University of Maryland Extension YouTube channel will be hosting this, all of our videos in this series, as well as some others that we have both on soil fertility, as well as other general horse keeping and horse management information. So check that out, subscribe to our channel so you're notified of any new video that is posted. Thank you so much, Dr. Grove, for this great informational lecture today. Thanks to all of you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thanks everyone. Happy National Forage Week. <laughs>